All right, welcome back everybody to CB Rivals podcast. It is the kickstart season and we are at episode four now, week four. Am I correct? I don't even know right now. Let me let me check it. Uh, one, two, three. Yeah, this is four, five. This is five. Oh, damn. Okay, so we're at week five. We've just had our regular season finished. Uh, we're going to talk about that, of course. But most importantly, we've got the finals coming up uh, next Sunday, 1st of May. And it's going to be really, really good. We'll be playing on a Capitals map. We'll talk about more, way more about the finals later. Uh, but let me first introduce to Corto, my co-host, the most famous and best well-known French tournament organizer you've ever seen. Um, thank you, Corto, once again for joining me. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you to you. Yes. And I'm, of course, CB. I'm organizing the CB Rivals uh, as well as most of it that comes with it. Um, and we'll be looking to expanding the CB Rivals over the next seasons uh, together with Core Tournament, which is something that Corto is organizing. Um, we've talked about that last week. We'll talk about it way more in the next couple of weeks, most likely. Um, but first of all, um, let me introduce you to our very special guest. It is the only undefeated team captain right now. He's on a winning streak for 17 games, and it is Temple Shot from We Are Clowns and Plebs. Welcome, Temple Shot. How are you doing? Hey guys, I'm doing good. Thanks, CB. How are you? Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. I'm really excited. Uh, I hope you are too. I know you've been screaming like crazy. Um, at least for this week, you've got a lot of plans you, you told me just now. So I'm really excited to talk to you about all those things. Um, so yeah, it's going to be excited. And actually, did you realize that you now are now on a 17 game winning streak? No, I know we're undefeated, but I didn't realize it was 17 games. That's pretty fun. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So you were undefeated since this like like third game of the semi-finals for uh, core tournaments. Yeah. So that's, that's a good streak. Enough. Yeah. Do you think yeah, you can... Yeah. How long do you think you can keep this going? Well, I don't know. I'm sure Pongard will give us a good, uh, some good matches on the weekend. So I don't know if we can maintain that, but we'll see. We'll yeah, try. We'll, we'll try our see. best. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Um, so Corto, because I know you're keeping track of all the tournaments, um, I'd like you to start with a couple of questions to Tampa Shot about like the other tournaments that they've played in. If you're good to go. <laughs> Uh, like no, no, no ju just I can say um, be careful because Pongard in core tournaments is not the same uh, like in uh, in Cyber Rival because uh, the time uh, is not very good for them so uh, they can uh, um, put all the, the good players in team so so we will see if I think the, the game will be interested. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. The Temple Shot, do you expect a different Pony card than you maybe have seen in the court? Yeah, de definitely. Yeah. Definitely. It's something we're excited for as well, because obviously it is always awkward trying to have these tournaments with American players in as well. So it's mm -hmm. going to be some exciting games, I'm sure. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, so let's just give you a rundown of what the finals will look like. Um, and then we'll go to the standings, actually. I just want to give you a quick wrap up of the season. Um, so the finals will be in this next Sunday. Uh, it will be best of five and we'll have a third place match and a first place final. The third place match will be at seven and it will be between Blame, Eli uh, Blame Elias and Eden. Yes, And it will be played on Reginopolis in the first two games followed by uh, La Grande Gloire on the third and the fourth game. And if it's necessary, we'll, we, we will be having a fifth game on the Grasslands field battle. And then for the final, it will start at nine. It's between we are Clowns and Pondgard, and the first two two games will be on La Grande Gloire, and the second two games, the third and fourth games, will also be on La Grande Gloire. Uh, teams have been banning between the, all the capital maps, and this is what they ended up with. And then if there's a tiebreaker needed for that game as well, a match as well, it will also be on the Grasslands field map. So that's what it will look like. Um, the unit bands are Falconetti and Flamers for the final, and if I'm correct, let me check it just to make sure we have it correct. The third place match also has Falco and Flames. So we have those very similar bands. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about those later um, because I think they've been showing up a lot. And yeah, that's basically what the finals will look like. Um, we'll talk more about it uh, as I'll bring up the standings as well. Hang on there. Here they are. So these are the standings for pool A. Just to wrap up the season, uh, we've seen 
uh, Pool A basically finished their games last week on Sunday and a week before it was Pool B. So we've talked already a bit, bit about Pool B in our last podcast. Um, this week we saw especially the bottom teams actually stepping it up a little bit. Um, Trikey run it down in the first game uh, on the attack, but then uh, on the defense, but then did a pretty good attack. Um, and the same could be said for Holy Crusaders and Odin's Legion. Um, as Surf Slayer we are, and Jack and Pont Guard actually got the wins quite convincingly, winning out on the on the last games of the season for Pool A. Pool B had already been finished mostly uh, last week. And we are Clowns, of course, at the top. Eden second, Rose and Slavs third and fourth. Love and Devotion, Sivos and Banished at the bottom. And uh, yeah, those are the games that have been played, as you can see. Uh, so these games have all been played uh, last week. And for Pool B and Pool A has all finished this week. With Chocolate Paladins and Blame on Icebeer being played uh, the week before. Yeah, um, I actually think, uh, Tempeshot, if I'm correct, that you guys invented the strategy that we've seen mostly being played on the last round on Harbor City. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, we played a couple of scrims against Elias and the Chocolate Paladins when they, when they fought each other, which is quite funny watching them do it. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the way I say it, because people say, oh, you didn't invent the strat. What, we, what I mean by that is the strat of suiciding with heroes, trying to draw the enemy as far away from the small gate as possible, and then respawning there to get that that rotation switch, that change of momentum, is what we did something against both those teams mm -hmm. um, in the scrims. So it was quite funny watching them then pull it out in their games after playing against us. So Yeah, true. Uh, I also saw that you, I, I think you commented somewhere that they didn't execute it or they didn't ex exactly understand the goal, perhaps, like most teams that, that tried yeah. it. So what I was trying to say by that was... Um, for us with the strat, it wasn't just about killing the units, it was about trying to pull them as far away from that small gate as possible. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I mean when I said those comments, because a lot of the teams would suicide for the units and then kind of pull that, the enemy team towards the small gate anyway. So it was yeah. quite obvious what was happening, they could mm -hmm. then rotate there. You saw it with the Elias game, they rotated there straight away. Yeah. And there was, who was it was playing, was there a game yesterday? I'm trying to think who played yesterday say that they did it as well yeah I think, but they ended up pushing uh, towards that small gate it yeah was slayers versus mm -hmm. um so slayers playing holy, holy crusaders yeah wasn't it yeah 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 and I, I, I think holy you, crusaders tried to do it then as well yeah true true and you could even see with pondgard pondgard uh, like dived really hard for the specialist units um, but it was like the building almost closest to the small gate so they all died together came in they brute forced the small gate still because they just outclassed the uh, their opponent but you could see mm -hmm. that yeah they probably yeah, made the same mistake that you, or at least that you think is a mistake because the small gate is so easy to defend if you were there on time, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it also comes down to you could see it's, it's just the small details. So, like with us, we would be sat there waiting all day and we're like, right, everyone ready? Okay, let's all spawn together. Mm -hmm. Whereas you saw with some of the other teams, they would just spawn one by one on there, which yeah. meant they didn't have that same kind of punch when they went through. Um, so, again, we didn't necessarily invent the strat. People mm -hmm. have done similar things before on other maps, but for this map specifically, it's just funny that we did it against these teams and then they picked up that strat when they haven't done it in scrims. Yeah. So yeah, that's really it was funny. just fun to watch. Yeah, it's, it just shows how good the strat is, I guess. Um, and it, it, it's always nice to see inventions like this. Like there's so many games being played, right? But um, actually executing and playing it on a tournament game when it like it really matters that you execute it properly in that one single game. Uh, I, I think that's on a whole different level uh, altogether. Yeah. Yeah. The main thoughts behind it was because obviously, if you look at previous tournaments, I think was it the last quarter, or it might be the last CBL, um, when Llamas started their strat of holding mm -hmm. on the on those stairs, which yeah. no other team had done before that. Um, so it was, it was mainly designed to try and counter that. So yeah, it, it worked for us. It didn't work mm -hmm. quite so well for other teams. Some of them did it. Some of them uh, it didn't pay off for. But yeah, it yeah. was it was fun to watch. Yeah, it definitely was fun to watch. Uh, you could see Pontecar took a whole different approach. For example, if you want to rewatch that game, make sure to, to do it. They just sell it out. Uh, a lot of teams actually sell it out, but Pontecar flew committed to it, and they they almost wiped all their whole uh, Odin's Legion just by selling on the defense. So yeah, only caught that game yeah. halfway through, but yeah, it looked like they they punished them heavily with that mm -hmm. selling. So yeah, that was... we were considering it ourselves, mm -hmm. but we wanted to try something different. So yeah, yeah, it was good. It was good. Yeah, I think it was good practice for sure. And um, on your defense, you actually had a pretty some pretty close fights, right? Uh, if, I, if I remember correctly. 
So our defense, we were defending kind of aggressively. So it was mm -hmm. like it wasn't defending on the base; it was defending in like the row in front of it of the base. Yeah. Um, so there were some close fights there because obviously we were split. We had a group on the resupply and a group on on sort of the east side of the map, as you look at it from the attacker's point of view. Um, but again, like like Nine Figures was saying before, you know, we we knew which fights we could take and win. We knew mm -hmm. which ones we couldn't. So if we knew we outnumbered them, we'd push around the corner, we'd take that fight, and we'd we'd try and clear that and then rotate back to the other side. So. Yeah, yeah, some some close cuts on there, but pretty decisive from us. Yeah, for say. sure. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Like pretty decisive. I, I think you were safe to say uh, you were playing pretty decisively the whole season. Um, how do you look back on this season for We Are Clowns? Uh, like I mean, of course the finals. Been, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Obviously, we still the finals to decide. I do think that the other group was had not better not better players in, but I would say more experienced teams because obviously you've got the likes of Pongard, you've got the likes of Surf players, which are some very experienced teams when it comes to tournaments. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you look at, for example, the Eden team in our side, not a bad team, but they are a new Eden team. They're not the Eden teams that have been in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so they're more new to the tournament side. And especially because the tournament rules are different on this tournament as well. If you look back at, say, the CBL, then you've got the three death limit and that kind of thing. So yep. it's it's a very different tournament. It's it's completely different to others, which is why a, a sort of suicide play style can work in this. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to if you do it on the CBL, you're kind of throwing the game because obviously you have limited lives. Yeah, exactly. Um, so for us, the, the season was was decent. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we had some good fun playing through season. It's, it's good practice for other tournaments as well. Um, but I think next season will be where it will be more difficult to to succeed. Should we say? Because mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of stronger teams together in that top brackets. The likes of Blame Elias, the likes of Jack, those mm -hmm. those teams that have shown themselves very well this season. Yeah. Um, I think will be uh, some interesting games. Yeah, definitely. Like, um, uh, for sure, that next season is going to be way, way closer. Um, I'm excited to looking at the final, see how Pondegard and you fare against each other. Um, so you mentioned CBL. Um, you've been playing a lot of tournaments with uh, plebs, and now we are clowns. Um, I'll, I'll bring up actually something that Corto collected as well. Um, it's like the standings from all the major tournaments from last year, basically. Um, so you can see that Plebs, you guys have been third in Rules of Ragnarok, third in Fall Fight, second in Winter War. Then you won a core tournament, this just a couple of months ago. And now you are in the finals for um, the CB Rifle. So can you just talk to me about how did your team get here into this position to seeming like one of the strongest teams right now? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the history of Plebs, like you say, you've got on the screen there, it, we started off pretty strong from the first season. I mean. The, the first CBL that we came into the Wars of Ragnarok, it, it was essentially there was two um, groups from the Origin House. You had the Origin team, you had the Plebs team. Um, obviously, the Plebs team performed a lot better than the Origin team, so they kind of stopped playing after that. But the mm -hmm. Plebs team carried on. We took, we mixed in some players from the other tournament team, took in some players, external players as well. Like we've got the likes of Amir and King Smexi in there, who aren't from our house. So it's not really a house team; it's it's its own separate thing now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's just been playing from the start. I'd say been playing at a consistent level. Yes, we've made some mistakes and lost some games. That's going to happen. The important thing is we learn from it, we get better. We're on, on an up streak at the moment, you know, came third, then third, second, then first, and now we're looking to maintain that leading position. Mm -hmm. um, so everything's a learning curve. It's going to be interesting to see this weekend because obviously it's a brand new map. It is a very interesting map to play as yeah. an attacker and a defender, even from the first scrims we've had now already. You know, we won the defense, I would say, quite well. But then the mm -hmm. attack we lost, it was quite a close one. Mm -hmm. But then we did lose the attack. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see what teams do on there. And there's definitely uh, many different points you can fight on that map. And different oh, points yeah. you can hold, different ways you can attack. Mm -hmm. It's going to be quite exciting to watch, I think. So Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad to say that. Um, so what do you think in general? You already mentioned it. Like uh, There's so many different rules in each tournament that you play in, right? Um, for I think the major change in this league... Uh, has been the no artillery rules. We've seen a lot of fighting. There's no just waiting around. Um, so it's, it's way more aggressive, but it also opens up a lot more opportunities to defend in certain places that normally could be uh, more tart out, basic, uh, like before you... Yeah, the no siege rule mm -hmm. changes it completely, especially if you look historically at the plebs team. We came in as a team known for spamming a lot of grape shots. Mm -hmm. There's been plenty mm -hmm. of memes about that from us on the endpoints of Wolfort and the likes of that. Yes, yes. So it, it does make a massive difference not having it. But at the same time, there are also unit bans in this league as well, as opposed to the CBL, mm -hmm. where there are no unit bans. So that massively changes it as well. Um, so you see a lot of Falcons and Flames banned every time because they are strong units. But then you see things like Keshigs banned as well, especially against teams that quite heavily run Keshigs a lot of the time. So you can see where they 
that they have banned, you see they struggle to to play as well without them. Um, but there's it, it massively varies how each map looks because even each map will be played completely differently depending on what is banned. So it, it's mm -hmm. very interesting to see the differences com yeah, uh, compared to the CBL. And obviously the, the no hero death limit as well does change things quite immensely as well because yeah. you can afford to play a lot more aggressive. You can afford to die because you know you're not going, oh crap, I've only got one more life mm -hmm. left. You know, obviously there's the spawn timer there and everything like that when you die, but yep. you you know you, you have to worry about trying to save yourself. Yeah, exactly. Whereas in the CBL, you sometimes have moments where you're like, oh, crap, I can't die, I'm going to try and roll out and get away because this is my last life. Mm -hmm. and so yeah, it does make a big difference. And yep. that's why I think this tournament, it's it's more about the unit control and being able to kill the units as opposed to the hero kills. Because mm -hmm. yes, the long spawn timers affect it, but historically you look at the CBL, you can lose a person three times before they've used all their units. Yep. Whereas in here most games come down to the last fight and whoever has the most units left. Yeah. So it, it's a very different tournament to the previous ones. Yeah, definitely true. That's, a, that's also interesting. So what else do you do you look for when you prepare for games? Um, or, or differently, like, how do you approach it? Like you say, so you say there's a big difference between CBL and this tournament in what you focus on. You may also pick different units then on different maps. How do you approach this? Uh, yeah, definitely, this? definitely. Um, I mean, for me personally, I always plan the defense first, hmm. about how I would ideally defend the map. Because then you can go from that thinking, well, they might be thinking along the same way, how am I going to attack it? Like, how would you attack your defense, basically? Mm -hmm. um, it's a good way to look at it. So then you can try and strat around that. But it depends on the team you're playing. It depends on, on which heroes you're playing. Because, you know, there are times where we're missing one of our key members because they've got, like, a family event or something. That can change how we play that map. Mm -hmm. um, especially when you look at the likes of, say, Amia and Zekis, our dual blades. If we're missing one of them, we have to play the map differently. If we're missing, for example, Silver, our short bow, then we have to play them out differently because these are people that, yes, we can play without them, but the play style changes when they're there or when they're not. So yep. everything changes each week, basically. And it can change on the day. Like we, Sometimes we change strats five minutes before we started just because <laughs> you know someone hasn't turned up or someone's gone, actually, why don't we try this? And it makes sense. So it's just being on that flexible side. Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. That, it, this is something that Pine also talked about in our uh, very first pod, or second podcast, actually. Um, about how he with Pontegard was also, he was working on building up the team uh, actually quite a few times because, like you said, um, the time schedule is quite, quite hard for them often, so they, they have to switch, swap players uh, regularly. Um, so one of the things he focused on in, with the team was communication and how teams or players fit together. Um, mm. Is that yeah. something that you focus on as well? Because uh, what I hear you say is also we focus on key players like the, with their wall, with, the, with their weapon a bit more. Yeah, I think it, it's we're quite lucky in the respect that a lot of our players have been playing together for a long time. Mm -hmm. Whether that's in the house, whether that's in the tournament team, you know, most of the players are from Origin, and most of those players have been playing even before Origin was created. They were in other houses together and things like that. So we have a lot of close communication where people know how people are going to play, they know where they're going to go, and all that kind of side of things. And I think um, Nine Fingers was alluding to this last time, but comms are very messy like if anyone listened to our, our communication during the game they would be surprised but it works for us um so like i'm i'm the main shot caller i will decide when we go but that everyone else is talking saying this 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 is over here this unit's here we could potentially push this side and then i'll make that decision to go um so there is a lot of people talking over each other mm -hmm. but it works because everyone knows what key things to listen to and so you can kind of tune out some of the background noise if that makes sense yeah, yeah. um so yes. it works for us. It may not work for other people, but it works for us and it works well as we've shown. So Yeah, definitely. Definitely what you've shown. So what you're saying is that um, the team is just feeding you with information, like lots of information, and you try to process exactly. this and make the right yeah. calls. Yeah. But then at the same time, because something that I see a lot with my team maybe as well, but also with other teams, I think that are lower in the standings, is that they may also make a lot of calls, but they may react to it too quickly. And then you see a couple of players split off do something and then it's not the right call and they have to move back you lose some units etc is that is, is that, that a big difference to experience i would no. say um with tournaments because we have that experience we, we know when there's times we can push and when we can't push we know where we can get away with things mm -hmm. um, and especially with a lot of the maps that we've played a lot of times before we know how we like playing those maps we know how enemy teams want to play those maps so we have that experience and and that's why i've said to teams in the past like you know we've had teams in the quarto teams in cbl that are new and they've scrimmed against us and we said look yeah, we may have beaten you in this scrim, but you learn a lot from it. You know, like at one point we were struggling to find people to scrim against us because no one wanted to play against us because yeah. either we'd beat them so well or we would just troll around in the scrims because historically my team hasn't taken scrims seriously. 
Um, <laughs> and so some teams didn't want to scrim us because we were just... It's better now, but to start with, it, my team just dick around and just troll around in scrims, All right. which was bad, but <laughs> it's a lot better now than it was before. Because um, at one point, we literally couldn't find any scrims. I think it went about two weeks where we just couldn't scrim anyone. Oh, wow. Because yeah, um, yeah. no one wants to scrim us. Whereas now you compare that to this week, I think we're scrimming today, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So and our Sunday as well, I think we've got scrims. Yeah. So. Yeah, right. pond well, out of, uh, we're preparing a lot for this moment. I was about to say, if you need any more <laughs> proof, uh, all of you who are listening, the finals are going to be very exciting. Uh, if Pond Guard does not bring their A game, uh, we are clans are going to have a good plan it's, prepared it's, at the very least. Yes. Yeah, it can be a fun <laughs> game, that's for sure. I'm sure yeah. it's going to be fun to watch. Yeah, I hope so, I hope so. Um, so I definitely want to talk more about the finals later, um, but I also want to talk about the, the, sp the different maps, actually, that we've played on in the tournament. Most tournaments play almost the same maps throughout the tournament because the, the same maps are being banned. Um, and we decided in this tournament to have a different map each round. Um, how did you enjoy or not enjoy that? And which maps do you think are, are good or fun? Yeah, I mean, I'd just say fuck Sun City because that map is awful. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it. we sallied on that map. Yeah, We didn't want to sally on that map, but we were just like, we don't want to defend this map. It's a awful <laughs> map to defend. So we just thought we'd sally instead. So hmm. apologies. I thought, who is it we were playing with? Was it Love and Devotion, I think it was, that we signed against? Oh, let me check it. Um, um, what week was it? Week 5, right? Yeah, it was week 5. City. And you played... Uh, oh, you played Banished. Oh, Banished, yeah. sorry, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. was Banished, yeah. Apologies to Banished. It wasn't It wasn't fun to watch. It wasn't fun to play. Uh, well, at least not for me, because I was the guy that was AFK on A the whole time on my team <laughs> sallied, so... Um, but yeah, it, it just, yeah, fuck that map. That map's awful. I, I, that's one of my least favorite, that and Orgolia are my two least favorite maps mm. in this game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's, yeah I, I do like, sorry, carry on. Oh, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. It's in case like this. So it's in case like this, uh, you, um, it's useful to have the, the death limit of attacker on attack. So you can close the game quickly. And mm. uh, it's only the case uh, when you need this. Yeah, that's true. Uh, if, if if you hard yeah, sell exactly. out and you win the game like ten minutes before the end, then it would be nice to actually kill the, all the players three times and have it end. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because I think that happened a few times in in Corto's uh, tournament. I think mm -hmm. with some teams selling out like that. But yeah, I, I don't like selling. It's not a fun way to play. But on that map, I just was like, no, I'm not. It's just an awful map to defend. So we yeah. we had a few scrims on there. And we didn't want to sally in the scrims because we didn't want people to know that we were going to sally. Mm -hmm. But we tried to defend it normally, and it's just honestly, it's just an awful map to defend. <laughs> so are you saying? To are, are as well, to be honest. But... So are you saying that you actually lost a few of the defenses on that map then? Um, I'm trying to think who we scrimmed. Um, I think we lost one of them to. I think it was either Jekt or Blame Elias. I think that we were fighting. I can't remember at this at the moment. All right. But we have lost a few scrims. We haven't like won every single scrim because that's the thing for me. Like scrims are the time to practice stuff. They're the yep. time to make mistakes, they're the time to learn. It's better to make those mistakes in scrims rather than make the mistake on the live stage. So for me, yes, scrims don't matter as much but in regards of winning them, but it's, they're still very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, which, like I said, at the start, my team didn't really feel the same way, but now they do. So <laughs> even for scrims, we have 18, 19 signups for scrims. So nice. don't struggle to find people anymore. Whereas to start with, we'd have maybe 12, 13 people would come to the scrims. Mm -hmm. You have to find random people from the house to join and stuff like that. So. Yep. It's a lot better now. But yeah, going back to your original point, I, I do like the fact that the maps are different every week because you did find that. When you look back at the Corso tournament and like 9 10 out of 10, it was Wolfort every time. Mm -hmm. Which, I'm not against because Wolfort is our home. A lot of people say it's a map we're very strong at, but it does get boring playing the same map over and over again. Yeah, yeah it sure can happen. I mean, uh, yeah, I think Wolfort is the most played map in any tournament. Like, no yeah, doubt, I think no, so. question, no questions asked. Uh, Highland Fjord is one of the others that's being played a lot. Um, and then there's just so many maps that haven't been played at all. There's also a few that are not fun at all. I have heard Sun City is not fun at, for most teams. Uh, Ellenburg, yeah. I think, is not also too fun. And you've got Quirk, is it Quirk Castle? May also be on the list, although some might like it. Um, Quirk is the other desert one. Quirk's not too bad, but that yeah. was quite heavily played. I think, wasn't it the first quarter? That was quite heavily played on there. Yeah. Um, and also, so you've got Ellenburg, who is not a great one. And then you've got, is it Riverlands Castle? That yeah, was it as well? Yeah. Oh, that's is, not a great map. Yeah, Rifflands is one of the maps I didn't want to have in the tournament at all because it's just so so defender favorite. It's it's yeah, it was pretty bad. It's pretty awful. I think we, we had to play it. Was it in the quarter finals against Surf Slayers that we played it, or was it one of the rounds that we played against them? I can't remember. It, may, it was either the final or it was the round before hmm. when, we, when we played against them. But yeah, that, yeah. That, that map is not fun. Yeah, it takes a lot of skill to win an uh, win an attack on the on the Rifflands castle. Yeah, <laughs> that's for mm -hmm. sure. Yep. 
Um, I think so. So I think it's on their attack. I think on that one. I think it wasn't that. Yeah, I think we went one one all on that one, then one on the field battle. I think, if I remember correctly. Yeah, good for it'll be. But yeah, it's not a fun map. Yeah, I know that uh, there's been a few wins on Riverlands Gaston because some teams uh, team didn't have 15 players had like 14 or 13. But yeah. Um. Anyway, moving on from that. Um. So. Let's go from the regular season maps then to the finals map. Um, the finals map, I think it's really nice to have the finals always be on capital maps because it kind of feels like it's a, it's a lift from the regular season, right? Or the regular bracket. Um, it, it, yeah. it, it's, it's just how the story gets created and how Conqueror Blades works in general with the territory wars as well. Um, you just need the capital. It's definitely the finals, nice the variation. Right? Yeah. Um, but there's also a lot of capital maps that people, of course, complain about um, because people always complain um, that they are not good to play on or not fun to play on. Um, mo mostly, I think when people not complain. Yeah, true, true. Um, so <laughs> I, I think it's mostly because of. I hope at least that it's mostly because artillery can be spammed. Like Algolia, it's not fun with the artillery. Um, Reginopolis too. If you see how the maps have been played the last couple of tournaments it's always been hiding behind the uh, what is it the c point and just spam the mortars for as long as you can try one push and that's it um so how do you think like on the glory because that's not that you were playing on mostly is going to turn out but also maybe the reginopolis map for the third place match without artillery yeah i think i think teams will probably still do that behind the c strap because mm -hmm. it was never really about the artillery for me personally, yeah. um, if we look at historically defending that C point, I can't remember who was the first team that did it. Was it Winx Club? I yeah. think that first yeah. pull, pulled out that behind the C strap. Yeah, it was Winx Club. Um, yeah. yeah, so historically, when we played on that map, people always, always tried to defend C. I think it had only been played once or twice before in tournaments because everyone normally banned it. Mm. I think, was it was it Llama Land that played on it, I think, first? Yeah. Like one of the first times in the tournament they played on it. Yeah. And the team that they were playing against, I think, held on C and just had like 10 muskets on C and were just spamming mm -hmm. stuff from there. Mm -hmm. yes. um, the problem with holding C is there's a couple of different ways to get into it. So it is actually quite hard to yeah. properly defend because you've got the breach, you've got the side gate, you've got the front gate, you've got the back resupply, you've got the, yeah. the uh, ladders coming up from behind. So it's unless you've got really, really spot on rotations and can mm -hmm. scout the enemy early, it's such a hard point to hold. Yeah, exactly. Porto, um, do you... Because you can hold so many different points. Yeah. Korto, do you, do you remember this match from Lamalant? I remember the, the musket and C-point and mm. uh, to, uh, to, um, to harass the, the unit uh, uh, on the, on the um, supply point mm -hmm. to death, in death. And uh, yes, musket on this map is what you say. Uh, artillery is very important on this map. And uh, musket is like uh, uh, hero artillery. So to, mm -hmm. to poke and to uh, to deal damage at distance uh, is very efficient for this. Yeah, yeah, it sure is, and especially at the map like Reginopolis, I guess. Yeah. So, do you think it's going to? Be, yeah. So you're saying it it might be played the same way, but of course it will give different results because uh, there's no. I think it will be played the same way. Yeah. I mean, even if you look at was it our games against Surf Slayers in the quarter final. Um, I think we beat them 2-0 on, on Reginopolis. Even defending, like it wasn't really about the siege, it was just about controlling. Because when you hold behind the point, like there's two access points really. Mm -hmm. You can you can argue there's a third point with the ladders, fine, but you can cover it a lot easier yep. and you can maintain a core setup on there. And especially if you've got a couple of long swords to heal the units, they can't really poke you down that well. Mm -hmm. So you could see from the way that we played it then, on defense it's very hard to push into even with siege. And then on the attack though, we just brute forced it. So we saw that we had... I think we had five or six people that changed to musket. So I think we had like some pike players and maybe some of the other players as well that swapped to musket just to poke and harass, kill a few of their key units. And then we just brute forced it with reapers, I think, if I remember correctly. I think we just went with like 10 reapers through the gate or something and just brute forced it. Mm -hmm. So it can be done. A diff teams will be able to play it differently. But yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how teams, how they play it on this third place game now. Yeah. Whether they sure go for that defense. They may even try and hold A and B. Teams have done that in the past as well and, mm -hmm. and had some fights there. It's just, it's a very open map until you get to see. Yeah, exactly. And uh, like the big thing on Reginopolis is there's so many places that you can hide uh, and not get trapped, which is always a big advantage for the attacker, but there's almost no exactly. good places to trap on the Reginopolis, except for the, that's the Yeah, that's another point about defending there is that you, you cannot trap any of that unless yeah. you can try and like bait them into the breach and then trap them there. So mm -hmm. the only thing you can really trap is if they've got any range up top throwing in. But if anyone's smart, they'll hide the units until you push. So 
you could counter that by preemptively trebbing, but then it's risking wasting a treb for nothing, and yeah, yeah. there's loads of things to change. I think they, they've got Falcons and Flames banned as well, so that will yep. make a massive difference. Yes, they will. Yep. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what unit setups they run for that. I imagine it'd be very Reaper heavy, just because Reapers are very strong at the moment, especially with Flames and Falcons banned. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Um, since you've touched on it, uh, let's go to the units actually. Um, so. Like you said, Flamers Falcons are being meant a lot. We had uh, Vasectomy last week. He was saying how he didn't enjoy the specialist units in general at all. He just wanted the old Palace Guard, Burial Pike, uh, Shield uh, meta back from Season 2. Um, so for the finals, we can ex probably expect the Sekali and the Shenji. Uh, these will all be played. Um, most likely, at least. Um, yeah, I mean, you can sit, sit there and say it's not a fun playstyle, but then at the same time, it can throw a lot of extra things in. So like you have Hero Suicide with those key units. You've got to actually protect those key units. Yep. Yes, Falcos and Flames are very devastating, mm -hmm. but you can counter them. It's yep. just they counter these teams that want to play these big heavy melee setups. They counter that. Yep. Like ours. Like, I mean, you look at, Pon uh, you look at um, I was going to say Pongard then, you look at Pleb's setup, and we were, tend to run a very heavy melee setup with one or two specialist units. But we always make sure that we dive for, those, for the enemy special units before we push. Yep. If we're looking at the quarter, then we use Siege to do it, or we suicide for them, or we try and get those picks that are going in, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's playing around those adds an extra dimension to the fights. It's not just one front line you've got to fight on. There's a the front line that you fight on, and there's the, the sides where you've got to go with the specialist units, you've got to cover the backs, you've got to cover the flanks. There's, yep. It adds a lot of variables to the game that makes it a lot more enjoyable for me. Because you can think, oh yeah, I'm winning this front push, but then all of a sudden you get flanked by Cav. Or you can think, mm -hmm. great, we've lost this we've lost this push, but we did kill their specialist units, so now the next push we can win. Yep. So it adds a lot more variation to it. Yeah, very true. I think we could even see it on... on uh, I'm not sure if it was Jorgens or Surf Slayer, but uh, I think Surf Slayers. Uh, they defended the Harbour City map in the same location that you tried to do it, uh, but they lost their specialist units in the first two fights, and then the third fight they almost lost it um, because they didn't have those flavors anymore. So you can see how those are really important for sure. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed the specialist units, I gotta say. Um, it just brings, I think it brings more flavor. Like You used to have the infantry calf, now it's more about a little bit of ranged as well. And also now with the uh, the support units coming up, like the banners, the healers, I think those two uh, may get more of an impact on games than we see right now, because players and teams still have to get you used to using those uh, units. But I think in a, if you play as a team uh, with one healer unit or one banner unit, resetting all the charges, healing everything up by poking, I, th I think it can be really strong. And I, I hope we get to see some of it yeah. in the final. I'm not sure. I know. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 an interesting viewpoint because I've had this discussion with you before as well. It's mm -hmm. like, yes, the healer units are very strong. They do heal very quickly. But would you rather take that or would you rather take, you know, a unit of palace guards or a unit mm -hmm. of circadian militia or something like that? So yeah. I think they could be very useful in very specific scenarios. Mm -hmm. But it's also, you've got to think leadership-wise, what's efficient. And especially now we've got the extra leadership where you can run our leadership gear. Most people... Like most of the veteran players will be will have 780 790 leadership if not more so i think majority of my team are 785 if not higher i know there's quite a few of us at 795 and higher mm -hmm. so when you're looking at that you think great i can go like reapers and then double tier four or would you want to then go a gold and a tier four and a tier three you know like you got to try and yeah, balance that oh, of course of course mm -hmm. It's like in theory, it'd be great having you if he does heal us up great that's fantastic but mm -hmm. in practice would you rather just have like a unit of tier four units instead yeah for that yeah. front line so exactly yeah th th that's always the, the discussion right like how much more worth does one unit of support or specialist unit give to the whole team um if you play one or if, if, even if you play more like you said you, you play two specialist units most of the time we see some teams play four even um but it, it's, it's also more of a risk because you have to protect those units you have to make sure that they have the time to do what they are supposed to do on the field um, but if you can create time for those support or specialist units to heal or deal the damage then of course they gain more value over time um, yeah, yeah and i think it varies per tournament as well so if you look at cbl for example you only have 700 leadership mm -hmm. you know and i would say part of the reason plebs was so strong in that is because we were one of the teams that early on realized that a triple tier four setup just works a lot better than the tier five setup a lot of the time mm. just because then you yes you have a slightly weaker push but you have three more effective pushes whereas if you're running double golden which a lot of teams are doing you'd have yeah two stronger pushes but then you have nothing for a third push or a third fight so yeah. and yeah. i think a lot of teams started to realize that and towards the end you could see a lot more teams playing triple tier four setups because mm -hmm. um, it just allowed you to have those longer fights if you needed to so yeah yeah that's interesting so yeah you can definitely see the meta changing slowly um 
Well, we'll see. We'll see how it goes for the final one. I'm really curious. Um, I just don't want to ask you too many questions about it because I, I want to make sure that we we get a final that that it might be unexpected as well. Um, so we'll, we'll leave it there. Be some unexpected things. Yeah. Happen. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. All right, uh, Corto. Um, I'll, I'll give it back to you a little bit so I can I can think. <laughs> um, well, you talk a lot. I think. Uh, uh, just one question, Dampar Shot, about your. Um, your affectation of uh, unit and uh, hero. Um, it's you, you affect a specific unit for a specific hero to have a synergy between the weapon and the, and the unit, or you, you, you less free uh, your player because you trust and uh, your player plays uh, the best unit he likes, uh, he prefers to, to play. You understand? Yes, it's a good question, yeah. So I think. I think it's a mix of both. So there are some members of the team where we'll say, these are the exact units you're playing. And it may be the case that, yes, there are people that are good with those units. Um, so historically, if you look at someone like Sesu, um, who's one of our musket players, he does play a lot of those specialist units, like the Shenjis, the Falcos, things like that, because he's good with them. And being a musket, he can play more effectively from the back line and control those units. But then you've also got the other side, where there's players like, for example, Amir, the Jewel Blade. A lot of the time we just say, pick whatever you want, do your own thing because a lot of the time he is in the enemy spawn, wasting three or four heroes chasing after him, doing that kind of thing. I want him to be on a unit he can mess around with, basically. So we've seen him play things like the uh, wolf units and things like that, no. because he just wants to confuse the enemy and just waste their time and, and mess around like that. But then there are times where you say, look, you have to take these units for this game because we need you on them. It, it varies depending on who's playing as well, because obviously there's some people that are good with the coconuts or the Zakeli militia, and there's some people that aren't. So for example, Amia has played them quite a bit, if our main players aren't there, he will pick them up. Or if it's a map where we need more of them, he will take them as well. So it's a bit of both, to answer your question, really. Um, nine times out of ten, we will plan every unit for every person. But then there's occasion of like, right, these are the first two units. The third unit, you can take what you want. I trust your decision on that. Mm -hmm. And even then, sometimes we're loading into the game. We're like, actually, you can change that unit to this. You can change that unit to that in those 40 seconds you've got loading in. So mm -hmm. yeah. It's kind yeah, of a bit of everything. Yeah. So, like I said, you you trust your team and your players to to make the calls themselves as well, not only within the battle but also outside of the battle and the preparations. Yeah, yeah definitely. Definitely. Yeah. And is that the same for the for the weapon classes? I know that. Um, uh, I think the weapon classes are changing quite a bit. We've seen a lot of pike and a lot of musket. We are slowly starting to see just a few a few long swords, uh, a, a couple of glaives. I've, I've seen more glaives lately as well, just one or two. Yeah, I don't think there's any glaive players in my team. Or at least I don't think we've played it in a tournament anyway. Um, I mean, unit wise, unit, unit, uh, hero, hero wise, yeah. <laughs> sorry, I can't um, hero class wise, I'm not that strict on it. People can play what they want, but at the mm -hmm. same time, if I see like 10 people playing more or something, I'm like, come on, guys, let's not do that because that's a bit <laughs> excessive. Um, so, yeah, we've seen a bit more longsword because with the buffs from that, I've always been a longsword player myself. I'm always more of a support player. Mm -hmm. um, or as one of my teams said today, I'm an enabler. I, I enable the other people to get those big clears. I'm the one that goes in first and breaks that front line or, you know, has that kind of effect on it. So we have seen a couple more longswords. There's a couple of maps. For example, Reginopolis, when we were defending that, we had three longswords, I think, just mm. for the healing on there constantly. That's quite a lot. So it does, it, yeah, it does mm. vary per map. Um, but yeah, ten, the, the general consensus, I let the team do what they want. Mm -hmm. There'll be some times where I say, right, we've got too many malls, let's have some more short swords in there, or, you know, we need a few more pole axes and that kind of thing. But generally speaking, I trust them to make the decision themselves as to what they play. Yeah. Cause I'd rather have someone playing a class they're comfortable with rather than saying you need to play this class because it fits better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you want people to feel com comfortable as well, whenever they, whatever they play, right? And you know, make sure they perform it. So how do you consider uh, execution compared to the planning? I think this this is something else that's being discussed a lot. Yeah, I would say that majority of the time my team has stuck to the plan. We've we've done what we went in to do. Hmm. It is also very different because you can plan all you want, but if the enemy team doesn't do what you're expecting, your plans not be the same. So what we tend to do with plebs, at least, is we will have a plan. We know in certain scenarios where we fight, what we fight, how we want to push, but at the same time we're strong enough and flexible enough that we can just say hey look they're pushing over there instead mm -hmm. we change the plan to this now this is where we're going to push so there have been games where we've gone completely off the plan but that's because the enemy team has done something we weren't expecting and that makes it for more interesting fights but yeah. i can trust my team enough that they can follow those plans so mm -hmm. and they are good enough just to change if i say right we're going to push this side instead they know what they're going to do 
and I might have to tweak a bit and say, right, you don't push there, push here instead, you come over here, you know, and mm -hmm. call those people out. But nine times out of ten, I can just say, right, this is where we're going to push now, and people know what they need to do and where they need to do. Yep. And that's just from the experience of playing in this team, at this in these tournaments for so long, you know. Yeah, we've got a few new players here and there each tournament, but mm -hmm. the core of the team stays the same every tournament, so. Yeah, yeah very interesting. Um, I, I'm actually very surprised by um, how you're... How you are apparently able to to make so many calls as a shot caller within a battle that you're also playing in? Uh, how do you, how do you even manage? <laughs> yeah, I mean that's I tend to give myself a more backline duty. Mm. So a lot of the time, if we're playing Falcos, I'll be the person protecting them. You know, so I can have a unit of you know halberd sergeants, whatever it is I've got at the time, I can protect that. But that means I can be in tab in the overview and, and be looking at this stuff. Um, for example, grasslands like the field battles, we haven't played it for a long time, um, but when we were playing that map. I would be the one that sits on base. So I could just sit there AFK on base, I could have the map open, I'd be shot calling from there. So it just depends on how you do it. But I've been shot calling for a long time mm -hmm. in this game, so I'm just used to having to do a lot of things at once. But that's why we plan so that I'm more backline, not having to focus so much, not having to micromanage on the front line. I can then just focus on the shot calls and rotations. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Like you so like you said before, and I wanna go deeper into this if you're okay. Um you say you're an an enabler or other people say even say you are an enabler for for the team for maybe more in life as well um so what about you uh you yourself as a person um how do you see yourself in this game and without maybe also outside of it yeah i mean I've, I've been playing this game for a very long time i've been in top houses for a long time as an officer as a shot caller whatever i don't i wouldn't say i'm a top level player i would say i'm an above average player but i'm a good shot caller and like mm -hmm. i say i'm an enabler what I mean by that is I'll be the one that goes in first. I'll be the guy that has the imp advance that goes in first or goes in with a longsword ult and breaks up the formation so everyone else can then get those, you know, those carry charges that come through and, and clear out 100 units and they get all the glory. <laughs> I'll be the one that helps them set that up. And I, I don't mind that. And, like, I've never claimed that I'm a fantastic player, but I would say I'm a, a above-average player, but just a good shot caller. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it just comes from experience, really, and just being able to process a lot of information a lot uh, uh, one time and being able to talk very fast as well that <laughs> yeah i think you've proven that already um i think corto has a uh, corto are you, are you still there are you still keeping up with all the, the english uh, <laughs> i understand yes but just i want to come back and uh <laughs> i want to hear about the, um, the weapon and the hero the hero weapon and the tournament uh, me personally i'm against this but uh, you what do you think about the possibility to ban one weapon mm. uh, like a unit if you want one weapon, you want. that could be interesting i think you probably have pike banned most of the time if you had that or maybe against certain teams you'd have certain weapons banned mm -hmm. so for example at the moment pole axis flavor of the month obviously with the cc immunity it makes it a very strong class you probably see that banned a lot yeah. you could even see things like musket banned a lot so that when you're attacking you don't have to worry about the musket span so it, it could change it massively but then you also run the risk of these people that main that class and only that class then they're kind of out of that game yeah they're fucked. um yeah. especially when you look at jewel blades or muskets and mm -hmm. things they tend to main those classes mainly so yeah. that could have a big impact on some teams that have these players that only play one class yeah. but it, it could be very interesting yeah. um it would be interesting to see it's such an interesting idea now that I think of it because uh, you're talking about it now as if it's only one weapon. But Corto, you're, you're, let's say we, we do this in an imaginary tournament. Um, you would have to allow each team to ban one weapon. So you would have two weapon mm -hmm. bans, right? I mean, that changes so much more. Yes, it's too much. Yeah. Yes. Or, or you just like, like the map bans for the final. You just ban one each until you get just the one that's left. And that's the one that gets banned, something like oh, that. Oh yeah, yeah, th th that could yeah. work as well. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah, but you need uh, you need uh, uh, you understand pair and impair. Uh, you know, it's a twelve or thirteen. Uh, it's a mm. twelve. You can ban one uh, one weapon. You need you, you need to have a thirteen or uh, thirteen or eleven uh, weapon if you want to work for this. But no, from, per, per, personally, I'm against because I I, I think uh, it's um, the developer job to uh, to balance the the weapon. So, um, and actually we have not enough uh, weapon to, to, to do this. And uh, it's like what you say, he, some player uh, is, uh, play specifically one weapon. So if you ban this, from this weapon, you, you target a player specifically and you, play, you, you target a gameplay. And uh, I think it's for, for, for competition, it's not too, the, the unit is not the same. It's not the same. But the, the weapon of hero, and the, 
And uh, you have a second uh, possibility is uh, uh, to ban um, after you can think about to ban um, uh, an, an armor, you know, mm. a setup. Uh, it's too complicated and uh, for, for me it's not a good thing. But uh, yeah, yeah. Good see, thing see you, no. No. yeah, definitely. Uh, I think you would then have you'd have a lot of target bans. Mm -hmm. So somewhere, for example, like Amia from my team, the very famous dual blade player in the game, yeah. you would probably have dual blade banned a lot against him. And yeah, he'd be fine to play another class, but that is his main class in the game. He might not even want to play the game at all if you ban that. Yeah, exactly. So I think you could, it, it could go down a dangerous road, but it could be interesting to see as well. Mm -hmm. Just maybe not in a, in a big tournament set like this. Maybe it's a, a tournament by itself where you can have these hero yeah. bans. Yeah, because you've got the likes of I don't know if you guys have seen. There's um, a tournament hosted by the Mighty Myrmidon. Um so he runs a tournament every every other Friday, mm -hmm. um, an NA tournament, which is it's a really fun one. I think it's called the Couch, the Couch Combat League or something. I can't remember. What it's CCL. It's called anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but it's you only have teams of eight, so you play on the smaller maps. You play on the Storehouse. You play on Green Peak, and uh, oh, we've fun. had yeah. some of my team have entered that. We've won the last three times now doing that. Mm -hmm. So it, it it's good fun. It's a variation, but it does mean staying up till half five a.m. in the morning on a Friday, <laughs> which is not ideal. But <laughs> that's a bit late, yeah, for sure. Yeah, but so yeah, yeah, so, so, so there's different tournaments can do different things. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think so. If if you if you want to do it with the weapon classes, I think it makes a lot of sense if you organize a, a, a deathmatch tournament because then it's all about the the weapon classes, the heroes. Um, and then it makes sense if you want to play a deathmatch tournament that you actually are able to play different weapons. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I guess it would make sense there. But I agree. If 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 you even if you ban one weapon, then you would always end up with the dual blade, for example. Then some people might just say, "Well, I'm not gonna play this because, yeah, it's 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 it can it can be annoying, but at the same time, it can also be really really interesting." Yeah. We'll it see. could be set even like this, where it's each week a different weapon is banned, yeah. something like that. Yeah, it could be interesting to yeah. see. That could also be a good variation for sure. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's nice. All right, excellent. Good idea, Corto. We might have to test it out somewhere, maybe in smaller tournaments, like you said, with um, Mirdi. Uh, I think I believe he's contacted me uh, this week actually about uh, organizing a few more small small tournaments, like seven v seven, eight v eight. Um, like in between it's seasons, very interesting because yeah. it plays very different. Because yeah. they banned golden era units, there's no CG either, so it it's mm -hmm. it plays very differently again, and it's it's been good fun. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, you can learn so much as well. And I think it's also more accessible for most uh, teams or players because even if you just have a group of five or eight, you almost have a team together, and then you yeah, can, and, and then you can play do it on the day. Yeah. yeah, they do it on the day where they have mixed teams anyway. So anyone that's spare, they just jump into the lobby, and then when they have eight, they put them into a team and they play. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot more accessible and it's only a one-off thing it's not like you're playing for 10 weeks with it so yep. it's it's a lot more accessible to people it's just a very small fun tournament yeah, exactly. but it would be fun to have some more people in there because like i say we've uh won it the last three times so it'd be <laughs> nice to have some more competition yeah exactly <laughs> all right so shout out to everybody who wants to get involved um go register to the meridian tournament um we might yeah, actually i think it's it on it the well. it's on the yellow turbans um discord server yeah, is where they run it so. all right yeah that's good all right yeah, so go there. Um, now that we've started with it, um, there's also still a few places left for the CB Rifles for next season. Uh, we are at 21 teams right now, actually. So I might have to go to three divisions instead of two. We'll see how that, that goes, but more about that next week. Um, but if you have a team and you want to join, make sure you have 20 men, because you need at least 20 players to realistically be able to get playing for seven weeks every Sunday. So make sure to get 20 players together and. Register on the Discord. That's it. You can join as well. Take a you shot can't sample shot. people each week as well. So you don't <laughs> need 20 the, the same the whole way through. True, 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 true. It's true. Yeah, you, you can swap out players during the season. So if you don't like someone or he's like, I don't know, he has a loud voice or he's just not playing good or he, I don't know, gets a lucky trap with 100 kills, which happened in our game, then uh, yeah, you can take him out <laughs> and get someone new in. All right, that's good enough. Um, all right. Um, so we talked a little bit about you, um, about what you do in the game, how you learn, how you enjoy it, and what you how you function as a player. I guess um, where you, you are approaching this very seriously, like the way you talk about it, the way you scrim, uh, what you do as a team captain. That, that's pretty obvious, and and it shows like, amazing results. I gotta say, um, do you do it? Do you do it just for fun, or do you also have some perspective, like in the nearby future or the future? Like, what is the goal for you? To be completely honest, to start with, it was just a bit of fun. I mean, we were the first team to register because no one had even registered at that point. Mm -hmm. And we were just like, 
screw it, let's just do it. It's a bit of training for the CBL when that comes up. Yes, it's different rules, but it's like training the communication, the, the different play styles on the maps, that kind of thing. Yeah. But then once it started getting going, more teams got involved, we started getting on a win streak, then it was taken a lot more seriously. Mm. Because who doesn't want to win? You know, I don't play to lose. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I would say to start with, it wasn't that serious. But then as it went on and the further it got into it, yeah, we took a lot more seriously. Yeah, nice. Um, so you can see that there are some people that are playing in this team that weren't in like our CBL team, for example, mm -hmm. because at the start, people that were in the CBL team just saw this as a bit of a, you know, at, at, to, well, to start with, there was no one signing up, so they just saw it as a bit of a joke. Yeah, so true. not everyone uh, signed up. But then obviously once it started going, teams, more teams got involved, bigger names came in, the likes of Pond Guard, Surf Slayer signed up for it as well. Then people started taking it more seriously, and yeah, we, we had a few roster changes, took in some of our older players, and yeah, took it a lot more seriously. Yeah. Yeah, clearly. I mean, uh, I think that's been the same for almost every team. Um, ever since we started, our, I started the picking up the tournament, uh, it's been exploding like crazy. We are almost at a thousand uh, members on the Discord as well. Um, almost all the games are being watched by um, like about four or five hundred players on different streams and different languages. It's pretty pretty crazy what what's happened in the last two months. Yeah, actually. you can just see it from the amount of teams and are signing up extra as well as it's gone. On, they realize how good it actually is and and. It's not that, it's just the experience as well. Like a lot of these new teams, they might want to play in the next CBL, they might want to play in some of these other tournaments, okay. or just be better at the game in general. And you're going you know, to fight against top level players and top level teams here. It's a great experience for anyone involved. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll actually let you talk more about those uh, great experiences for new teams, but also the, the teams that are fighting at the bottom right now. They will be moving to the Rustic Division in, in the next season. You will be moving to the Feudal Pool Division next uh, season. Um, how do, how do you look at those teams and what they what they try to approach like how, how they try to approach the game but also what yeah, what they should aim for maybe like any tips or tricks I, mean, I think it'll be easier for the newer teams next season because they're going to be against lower level teams mm -hmm. let's say i don't want to be rude to people but you know they're against less experienced teams should no. say it's a better way of putting it um so it will be easier to get into it because obviously there are some teams we played in this season that have lost every single game or, or lost like nine out of ten of their games mm -hmm. which is disheartening you know it's not fun to lose especially when you're playing you know with everyone watching because yeah. there are some big even in the, some of the teams that lost there are some big names in them as well that are very well-known names in the game so it's not fun to lose but my mm -hmm. advice to those people is you know it's an experience you're coming in especially in our group as well against the likes of us the likes of rose the likes of eden these are very experienced tournament teams that have been or very experienced players that have been around playing together for a long time yeah. So my advice to them is use that experience, learn from them, get better. And that's ultimately what we want as well. We want to have more competition in this game. You know, I don't want to come across cocky, but we don't want to win or, or you know, be in the top <laughs> all the time. We want to have these good fights and learn from ourselves. Yeah. Because there are times that, you know, we've come... Oh, you're back? Yeah, yeah. Back. all right, yes. good, you're back. Go ahead, go ahead. It's all good. I'm trying to think where, <laughs> where it cuts off there. Uh, but yeah, so use the experience, you know, don't get disheartened by losing. Yeah. And it's the same thing which we were trying to get more scrims with people as well. And th oh, hang on. You're dropping out, so we'll wait a few moments. You know, we've had these interactions with teams in the past, like Marker G's team in previous tournaments, where I was trying to give them advice and, and help to get them improve. Because it was their first tournament, and yeah, they, they got knocked out of the tournament, but they performed decently for a, for a first-time team. Mm -hmm. I think their game wasn't their game, like 13 v 15 as well, and they still got close to winning. So yep. it's just using that experience and getting better. Mm -hmm. You know, Plab's team has been around in some format or other for, what, like four or five seasons now? Yep. If we look back, what was it? Wolves of Ragnarok was the first time we came together as a team. So we have that experience. And you just got to realize that you're playing against very high experienced teams. Mm -hmm. Learn from it and improve from that. Don't just get, don't just lose and be like, oh, well, we lost, it's over, you know, let's not try again. And especially going to next season now with this tournament, the new teams coming in will be in this in this lower pool. Was it the Rustic pool you called it, I think? Yeah, the Rustic division, so yeah. They're yep. going to have this chance to show off and play against these other teams. Yes, there will be some other strong teams coming in. You've got the likes of Kebabs that are joining up next mm -hmm. season. They look like a strong contender. So you will have some strong teams going into there, but you also have more balance then with the teams from this season. Yeah. So you can have some better fights and some closer fights and maybe more wins next season. Build up that strength, build up those strategies, build up your communication, your teamwork. Yeah, exactly. Ultimately, yeah. like 
most fights will come down to the teamwork and the, and the coordination rather than the individual skill. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, very interesting. And also, uh, like you said, so yeah, for focus on the process. I mean, when you just enjoy the games that you're playing, you're playing against good opponents, you're having good fights. Um, it's it's just a lot of fun and. Uh, there's also the perspective of getting more games and even if you lose a lot you will just get slotted into a different division at least for the zebra rifles and you get to play against more equal leveled opponents and then maybe you can rise again into the league and yeah you just get more playing more good it's, it's all good it's just um, it's just learning from your mistakes at the end, yeah. end of the day i mean you look back to even just using plebs as an example that the first cbl we lost to was at eg on harbor city mm -hmm. so that massively changed our, our outlook on that and the way we work and our strats mm -hmm. for that map and just in general as well. Yep. Um, so we're just learning from those mistakes. And then obviously we came third the next time, we learned from that, then we came second, then we came and we won the, the last quarter. So it's just learning from those mistakes and improving. Yeah, absolutely true. Yeah, very interesting. And I, I think you can already see it in, the, in this season as well. Uh, teams like Chocolate Paladins, but also Odin's Legion, Love and Devotion, they've all been getting a couple of wins. Chocolate Paladins actually even competed for the top four um, in, in, the, in, in the pool A. Uh, up yeah. until the last round against Blame Elias. Mm -hmm. um, so they're definitely a, like a new team that's showing up pretty strong and may, they may be a very, very good contender for the first or second place next uh, next season in the, in the rest of the yeah. I think Blame Elias will be a strong contender next season as well. Um, yeah. From the games we've seen, from scrumming against them as well, because mm. they're one of the teams that we scrummed against most and they are a very strong team. I think now they're getting the experience and they're coming into their own a bit more they're gonna be a team to reckon with next season yeah totally yeah we'll, we'll see how they do in the third final against jacked um they've also been getting stronger i think comparatively uh blame Elias have been getting relatively stronger compared to jack who have been pretty strong throughout the whole season um mm. yeah so definitely they'll, they'll be i think jack, starts, jack started off very strong i think they've sort of slipped a little bit in the last couple of weeks mm. um but we'll see how it goes now towards the, in their in their last game so yeah yeah that'll be really good um all right let's jump to predictions actually uh predictions for third place what do you think Corta? Oh, oh. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, yeah me uh, i know uh, eden uh seeing a long time and uh, i don't see all the match of uh, of blame Elias, so mm. uh, i uh, i see uh I talk of I say uh, Eden. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. There's a lot of French players there. Uh, I get it. I get it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, for the first place, for, for the second match, uh, there's no hard, no hard feelings. Yeah, no pressure. That's fine. No hard feelings. I'll just <laughs> I'll just turn them off and then you can say. <laughs> See if um, uh, if I uh, use my uh, my knowledge about the core tournament, mm -hmm. I must to say we are clone. Because Pongard, yeah. I, I don't go, I don't best, I don't do a, a good performance in the mm -hmm. tournament. So, but uh, I think the match will be inter very, very interesting. <laughs> yeah, absolutely agree. So, um, and what about the score actually? Third place match. What's it going to be? Eden winning, three zero, three one, three two. What do you think? Three two. Three two. I okay. Yeah. yeah. Good. All five well, games. I like it. And and for the well, final. Uh, the same. The same three two. All right. So we're oh, getting much. we're getting ten games. The castles will be really really busy. That's going to be good. All right. Temple shot. What about you? Oh, you can start with the third place match, of course. Third place. I think just from the scrims that we played and the matches we've had. Because I mean, we played against Eden in round one, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. yep. um, on Wolfort, admittedly on our home map, but still. Um, I think I've got to give it to Blame Elias. I think 3 2 to Blame Elias. I think they're going to just win in the field battle map. Mm -hmm. um, but for the finals, I mean, I've, I've got to go in confident. I'm not planning to lose, so I'm going to go 3 0 for, for Pines. So. That's, that's I, impressive. I've got to, I'm, I'm that's going to go in confident. Yeah, we've got to carry on our streak of not yeah. losing a game. So. Right. You, you can drop the and mic, we'll see we'll walk see away. Happens. Yeah, drop the mic, walk away. It's got so good. All right. <laughs> Pull the guards, be ready. Um, they're, they're coming for you. They're going to give us a run from me. It's going to be a close final for sure. Yeah. All right. We'll leave it there then. Okay. So um, if you were not excited for the finals already, um, I'm sure you will be now. 3-2 um, for third place match, apparently. Uh, either side can win. And then for the final, it might be a trio, but who knows? Corto and I, we think it's going to be 3-2. Um, I'm looking forward to it so much. Um, so tune in on Sunday from 7. Uh, it will be casted by Zelgius, King Alpha TV, Mark of Ghee, and Nine Fingers. They will be um, doing duo casting one after the other. Uh, and they've divided the games. 
Uh, you can see all of the schedule on the CB Rifles Discord. Make sure to head over there. Also go to the CB Rifles YouTube to rewatch all of the games up until the finals. And then if you want, you can also go to Twitter. I just own a Twitter for some random reason. No followers yet, so go there if you want to follow something there. But I think most of it is on the Discord anyway. Um, so you can try that. Um, expect some more content to come, I guess, in the next week. Um, hopefully we can get some voice comps after the finals from Temple Shot. I would really love that. Um, maybe somewhere yeah, be down you, for can, that. You, you can edit some, uh, get the interesting bits out of there and then drop all the fun. Uh, that would be really, really cool if actually. Um, so yeah, we'll see what yeah, we can we do. Can, we can see. Yeah, yeah. It would just be a, a jumbled mess of everyone screaming like, what the hell is going on there? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> kill them, kill them, kill them. Yeah, all right. Yeah, that's all good. I, th th that might actually be so fun. Uh, I do want to make a compilation somewhere of like the, the pre-game talks about like when you select the heroes and units and all that. It um, might be pretty, yeah. pretty cool. All right, anyway. Um, so that's it for us this week. It uh, was a good talk. Thank you, Temple Shot. Um, I yeah, thanks for enjoyed me. Your, your insights. Um, it's been very, very interesting. And I, I hope teams learn from you. And I hope teams get to enjoy your games on Sunday. Um, I hope teams want to scrim us as well. Yeah, all right. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, if I remember correctly, you still have time on Saturday, right? And somewhere in the morning. <laughs> Yes, yeah, Saturday morning, I think we're still free, so yeah. we can sign yeah. people up there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so expect a lot of DMs uh, after Wednesday because the podcast will go live on Wednesday. Um, oh, I can't wait. Exactly, that's <laughs> it. Um, I might have you back next week if you win the finals. We'll see. Um, but good luck for now. Have a good one, uh, guys, and uh, see you next time. Yeah, thanks for your time, guys. Take care. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.